Welcome to Animal Behavior. In the previous class, we have learned the development of behavior. Uh, in the development behavior class, we have learned that the, you need both uh, environment and genes. And environment genes interact with each other for proper behavioral development. And this week, we're going to study another important aspect of behavioral development, which is learning. So what is learning? You know that you know, we learn every day um, in the class, in, <laughs> at homes, you know, in, the, in the society. And so we are quite accustomed to the learning. But what is learning exactly? The learning in animal behavior is change of behavior. That's the change of behavior. But it is based on experience. Experience is coming from the environment, which is the environment to stimuli. When I, and I also use this word adaptive. Do you remember in week two, we learned that this word adaptive, uh, this word is, is, we use it in a very specific way in evolutionary biology. It means that if something is adaptive, then it tends to propagate genes. So learning is adaptive, adaptive then the animals uh, can propagate its, uh, their genes effectively through learning. And learning enables animals to respond to the environmental conditions. And let's look at why learning is important using these examples here. This is the female wasp. And the, this female wasp release sex pheromones. You know, that's the uh, chemical attract the uh, male, uh, male wasp to, to, to this female. Then the, uh, the male wasp, they fly to, the, to this female and mate uh, with each other. Uh, but this is the, uh, the, this flower, it's the uh, kind of an orchid, it's a very common flower, orchid. And this flower also emit the, uh, the sex pheromone. It's not really sex pheromone, but it's, it's, like, it's called a mimetic sex, ver fe sex pheromone that is very close to the, uh, the one released by the uh, actual female. So the male, here's the male, it is attracted to this, uh, to this flower. It lands right on here, and this, you, know, you see this structure here? This structure, it just looks like the, uh, the female abdomen of this, this wasp. So this male now landing on this petal, that's, that's the petal, okay? That's the petal of this orchid, and trying to mate with this petal. While doing this, that's the, uh, that's the pollen, the yellow stuff here, that's, the, uh, that's pollen. Uh, touched on the on the back of the uh, wasp, so that the uh, when this wasp uh, visit another flower, trying to, to uh, <coughs> trying to mate with the, with a the flower, then uh, that flower, uh, the pollen of this uh, flower can uh, can can be pollinated. So let's look at the uh, uh, this poor male, this poor male wasp. Uh, it is now this this wasp is fooled to mate with this, uh, with, with this plant, this, this orchid. If he, this male cannot recognize whether this is a real, a real female or, the, uh, full, or, or, or a flower, he may come to this visit over and over and over again. So he, never, he may have never have a chance to mate with a real female. But this wasp, this wasp has a capability of learning to distinguish from the, uh, <coughs> uh, well, so once he visited this flower and realized that this is not a real flower, okay, and this is not a real, uh, real female, that's the so orchid flower, um, uh, the, uh, uh, <coughs> it looks like the, uh, uh, the, the, the female, then it never come back to the same flower again. So when you transfer flower to a new, uh, to new, new, new place, then at the beginning, at the beginning, this particular flower is visited by many male wasps. But as time goes by, the number of visits by the male flowers tend to decrease because that happens because males to learn to avoid these particular flowers. So this, this male wasp used his experience, okay, experience with the uh, mating, with, mating with this uh, orchid flower and then they realize that this is not a real female, then store the information of the, uh, the locality of that flower. 
then it changes behavior by not visiting the same flower again. That way, males save time and energy by avoiding the particular flower, particular orchid, and at the same time, it improves their chances of encountering a receptive female. So, um, you still, so when there is a, uh, the, the uh, smells from the uh, smells of the, uh, the pheromone, then the, the male respond to, the, uh, respond to the, the sex pheromone and fly to that, the, uh, to, to that location. But if that, the location is from the same flower, and he's avo avoid visiting that flower. So learning here is very critical for, the, uh, for, this, uh, for this wasp. Okay, now we have we just learned this why learning is so critical for the uh, for the animals, and there are uh, several kinds of the uh, learning and and they are the habituation, imprinting, spatial learning, associative learning, social learning, and problem solving. And we're going to study uh, these four here in this uh, in, in this online lecture and and you're going to have these two uh, in the uh, <coughs> in the um, on the uh, on the on, on, on the online uh, on the online. Let's look at the imprinting. Okay, uh, you know this this goose, uh, this the chicks of the uh, of these geese. When they were hatched from the uh, from the eggs, what they saw first was this person, and this person is the one of the uh, uh, the only the ethologist. The, he he's like a founder of the animal uh, animal behavior. Or the ethology called ethology. His name is Conrad Lawrence. So, uh, when this, uh, the uh, the chicks of this goose they hatched, they uh, if this uh, if they saw this person uh, the first time, then they regard it as their 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 mom. Okay, their mom. So that this these chicks uh, follow uh, Dr. Lawrence wherever he goes because these these uh, the, these chicks are imprinted. To this doctor, to Dr. Lawrence. So in printing, that is irreversible, cannot change, cannot go back. Okay, irreversible and limited to a sensitive period in an, an animal's life. It ha you have just very tiny time window that the uh, imprinting occurs. That's like a real rapid learning, so that you learn it. Okay, this person is your mom, and then if that period, maybe just a day or two, uh, passes, then uh, the imprinting cannot occur again, and the the important information of bonds bet, uh, between the parents and young uh, in, in in animals, and this imprinting is used for the uh, reintroduction of this endangered spe species, whooping crane, and this this crane is the tallest North American bird. Its is, is height is about 1.25 uh, meters. And this is a migratory waterfowl. Its wintering, uh, its it breeding ground is northern Canada here, and that's. It, but it overwinter. It migrates to the uh, to, uh, to to the Texas coast and overwinter overwinter there. And the, the the following spring, it migrate back to the uh, breeding uh, breeding ground. But in 1940s, there were there were about maybe 16 birds of these. They were almost the, down to the uh, down to the ex extinction. So people they try to uh, try to revive this species by artificially rearing the uh, <coughs> artificially rearing the the, uh, the the chicks, but the chicks they didn't know how to migrate back to the uh, you know back to the uh, Texas coast or the or, or the Canada. So what they used was that they uh, they used this airplane, that's a real tiny airplane, uh, to uh, mimicking. Their moms, so that when the, the 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 chicks of this crane hatched, they heard that the uh, the engine engine noise of this uh, <coughs> of this airplane and something like a uh, you know engine engine the, the the airplane shaped toys, that was the, what they saw first. So they were imprinted to this airplane. So by the time uh, these these young birds are old enough to migrate, and then they followed this the small airplane. To the uh, their either breeding ground or their the winter uh, wintering ground. So they uh, the the people here used the imprinting critically for the uh, reintroduction of this uh, species in North America. Uh, let's look at the spatial learning. Uh, 
which is imp important for the, uh, for the navigation. For example, like, uh, you know, when you are here in this building and you, you, you want to find the front gate of this EY University, how do you get there? That's the, uh, that's the spatial learning, okay? Uh, we use this in every day. And we, people, you know, tend to use, they tend to use uh, different methods to navigate, uh, navigate on, 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 on campus. But one of the methods we use, and this WASP use, is the uh, landmark orient orientation. Land. It means that like, you, know, you, you just, you, if you go out, you just find a, like a tall building, like a postco, go to the, uh, uh, go to the uh, ECC, then you will see the uh, like a front gate. That's, that's the basic, basically landmark orientation. And they, uh, uh, and this WASP, people also demonstrate that the, uh, this WASP used the, this landmark orientation in finding their homes. And uh, <coughs> this WASP, when, when leaves her, uh, her nest, her burrows, uh, her, out of her, her nest, he makes some, some, you know, some visits over, um, over, over her nest, then fly back, and, and, and the uh, spatial learning takes place when she flies over, over her nest. So people place some objects here, that they are like a pine cones, pine cones, when uh, this wasp leaves her, her nest, then, then they move these uh, pine cones sli slightly about like a, a, a slightly over here, then this wasp have a choice between entering this uh, this nest and 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 right here, and she chose to enter and uh, enter right here instead of uh, instead of her, her real uh, re real nest. And this ex uh, uh, experiment demonstrated this wasp used the landmark orientation for navigation. Associative learning, that's a very common method for, the, uh, uh, for, um, for, for us humans to, to learn. Basically, animals learn that a particular stimulus or the response is linked to a, to a reward or, or punishment. Uh, uh, and the um, most common type of the uh, associative learning is the trial and error learning. Here is the uh, coyote. Um, and you look at you know it's really painful because the uh, the spines is all over. That's the spines of the porcupine. Probably he was very uh, uh, this coyote is very interested in, in this porcupine, and then try to uh, try to attack this porcupine like a nose first, and then he got like a punished with his uh, spines. So probably the next time, these coyotes will not attack the porcupine head on. So, so probably uh, he associate now the uh, porcupine, uh, <coughs> uh, porcupine with this, the, uh, some real painful experiment so that uh, not, he, he's not going to, he's not going to the attack the uh, porcupine again next time. That's the associative learning. And another important, uh, uh, another important learning method, that's the uh, social learning. And this is social learning, so basically what I'm doing now, what I am and you are doing uh, right now is the social learning. Uh, you learn uh, by, by, look at, uh, by looking at me and learning from me, that's social learning. Okay, I teach and you learn, that's, that's social learning. That's what we, we do every day. And that also happens in the, uh, in the songbirds and in a lot of mammalian species. And this experiment is done by Dr. Peter Mahler, the University of California at Davis. And this bird is like a, it's a sparrow. It's like a very common sparrow on, on campus. But this particular species is a white crowned uh, sparrow. <coughs> this is the, um, the songbirds is the very common bird. Uh, it, take, it takes up about two thirds of the old bird species. And <coughs> one of the interesting uh, observation of this songbird is that the uh, geographic variation uh, in bird songs. So here, that's the uh, sonograms of the uh, uh, of these these white crown <coughs> white crown sparrows from marine area. That's the north of the uh, <coughs> north of the San Francisco. That's the uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the uh, sonograms from Berkeley. That's the sonograms from the Sunset Beach. All are the same species, but different populations. 
And if you look at these sonograms, they are a little bit different, okay? They, so they sing differently depending on where you are. So then that's called the dialects. Like we humans have dialects, and like, likewise, these, uh, these songbird species have dialects depending on where you live, okay? Uh, they have some different songs. So why do they have dialects, okay? Why do we humans have dialects? Because, well, that's what we are going to do. Why are we going to study here? There may be like two different hypotheses about these uh, song dialects in bird species. The first one is that you know the uh, the white crowned sparrows from from Berkeley area and the, from marine area they are uh, genetically different with each other. So so that the uh, the, the genetics alone may explain the difference in uh, in in, in geographic variation in songs or the differences between birds in two areas might not be. Uh, you know, hereditary, this means like a genetics, but rather environment, totally from the environment factors alone. Uh, let's see whether, whether which one is right. Okay, so what the Dr. Peter Mahler does with this, uh, uh, with this white crown uh, sparrow is that the, uh, he take out the eggs, eggs from the nest of these bird species, and then hatch them in the lab. Uh, <clears throat> artificially, and then hand rear them, hand rear them in the lab, and keeping them isolated from the sounds made by other singing birds, so that it's like the uh, these birds are you know well well fed uh, in the lab, so that you know he has he, uh, this bird has no problem at all uh, in terms of like a food or predators, but you never ever heard of the songs of the other bird species when this individual be became adult, then it's about, it took about 150 years old, then they usually become adult, then they produce some abnormal songs, not uh, typical species-specific songs. You know, they produce some sound, but that's not species-specific, so that the, uh, you cannot really sing their own species-specific song. Okay, now what he did was that the uh, this is the, the, the real is, is, is the same, basically. But he played back the songs, he played back the songs of this bird species. You know, not by the real bird. We <coughs> get the speakers here, and then play back the songs of, the, uh, of this bird species. And he did it between 10 to 50 days old. You know, that's called a uh, critical period or sensitive period. Did you remember that the earlier? Uh, the one type of learning, that's the imprinting, and imprinting takes, uh, takes place at some specific time, and, and, and that's called like a sensitive period, period or a critical period. Learning takes only that specific uh, uh, place, and the habituation occurs right, uh, I'm sorry, that's not habituation, that's the, uh, that's the imprinting, okay? Imprinting occurs during the critical period, that's the same, the same thing here in this white crowned, white crowned uh, the sparrow species for their uh, uh, song learning. So when you play back the songs of these bird species, when this chick is about 10 to 50 days old, then when they, uh, this chick become, uh, becomes adult, uh, they produce normal species-specific songs. And so we know that the, uh, in order for, for this species, uh, for this male uh, to, uh, to produce their songs properly, you need to have some, uh, the, the songs from other males, okay? The songs of this bird species during, during this critical period. But interesting thing is that <coughs> during this critical period, okay, uh, critical period, if you play back the Berkeley song, okay? If you play back the Berkeley song, and they will sing the Berkeley dialect. But if you play the marine, Marine song, maybe the same uh, same bird, then they, they sing the marine dialect. So that it, you know, if you play back, you know, some uh, Buckley song, they play Buckley, uh, they sing the Buckley dialects. It's totally environmental effect. So it depending on what kind of song, or what kind of dialect you, you you play to the to the chicks, they will play the same song when they become adults. So that seems to be an environmental effect in the song development. However, it's not totally environment, okay? 
not only environment. If you play the uh, songs of the, some totally different species, and uh, they, uh, they cannot produce their own song, they sing uh, some abnormal song, but if you play the songs of the different species plus songs of the, uh, the, the same species, then they will sing the song of the uh, white, crown uh, white, white crown sparrow. So that, you know, it's kind of flexible. Their learning ability is kind of flexible. They can learn the um, Buckley song. They can learn the marine song. But they cannot learn uh, another species song. So it, it, tend to, uh, it, it seems to demonstrate, de demonstrate the, uh, their learning capability is the genetics. It cannot, it, it's, it's open to their own species song, but it's close to the uh, songs of the uh, other species. Now, he did another important experiment. Okay, important experiment. He so he played back songs of the same species during the critical period. So uh, so this bird species uh, is, you got the imprinting uh, during the critical period. But after that, he deafened. He, uh, you, you can deafen this bird, so he cannot he cannot hear what he he just sung. If he, uh, if this bird is not able to hear the hear itself sing. Uh, after hearing others, others sing, uh, then you cannot produce the uh, no, you cannot produce normal songs. The ability to hear the oneself sing appears to be critical critical for the development of a complete song. So, so let me let's summarize all here. That's the uh, uh, the, the the period from from it hatched here. It hatched of uh, uh, from the. Uh, from the uh, from the eggs, 10 to 50 days. You know that's we call the critical period. Uh, that's the neural templates open for the uh, for the uh, for the species specific song. So you must hear the songs of the your own species during this critical peri period. So you have to memorize the songs in your some in your template in the brain. And from 50 to 150 days, nothing happens. But you store the uh, information of the uh, of the uh, of this song in your brain. But 150 days, that's the time when you became uh, when you become adults. To 200, and it's called they they sing, but it's, it's a sub song. What's a sub song? Is that that's the song, but it's not complete song. The song is is kind of awkward. It's not real their own species specific song. You have to like modify it into your into the complete full song. So you need some period period where you kind of you you learn you practice your your own song to the uh, to the to the to the perfection. So here during this period when you play the sub songs, um, they you know they sing okay they sing. Uh, we know that that's not real complete song, and you hear that the what you just you 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 just sang, and then you they, you match what you remember in your brain, and then the uh, song you just you just you, you just sang, and this should be matched. If 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 these two if if something that you remembered and something that you you just sang, if these two are not the same, then you practice. Okay, you practice. You change your song until. Uh, until what you just sing is exactly what you just remembered in your brain. Then you became seeing completely your own species-specific songs. So here now we know that the um, uh, could, um, the these white crown uh, sparrows, uh, they if they want to sing a complete song, what the, um, uh, the there's song proper song development in this bird species. You need some continual interaction between the uh, organism, the, the bird, and its internal and external environment at every stage of development here. So it's basically the same story from the previous class. For a, for a proper behavioral development, you need both genes and environment. They need to interact with each other properly. It's the same thing again here in the, in the song learning of the, uh, uh, in, in the song birds. Two factors, like both genetics and the, the environment factors, they, uh, they, they need social learning here. They need social learning uh, from, from, from other males. Uh, also, they need to practice here so that you, they, they match between what you remembered and what, uh, and what you, you just sang. They should be, should be matched. So, 
at every stage of development, you need an interaction between the, uh, between the, 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 uh, the, the genes and the, uh, the environment. And the, the song development is, is clearly demonstrate, uh, demonstrate the, uh, the, 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 uh, for the proper behavioral development, uh, you need to the, uh, uh, continue interaction with both genes and uh, environments. So um, for the last week and this week, we have studied the, um, uh, the uh, development of behavior. The most important thing you remember is that you know, the, the organisms cannot separate completely from the environment. Okay? Organisms, organisms, or the, the genes that are, that are turned on at the specific stage, continually interact the environments. They get the uh, signals from the environment for a proper genes to turn on so that the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> um, the, the behavioral development, again, uh, you need both the genes and environment interact, uh, continually interact with each other.